Section 14 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The American Book of the Dog. Geo Shields, Editor. Section 14. The Beagle Hound by Herman F. Schlelhaas, Pius H. Through a miry swamp and wooded vale, the beagles run the cotton tail. The hounds give tongue, the welkin rings. Tis music fit for lords or kings. The beagle is undoubtedly one of the oldest breeds of dogs in existence. As in the case of most of the old breeds, its origin is unknown. In examining the various prominent works on the dog, we find frequent reference to the beagle during the times of George the Fourth and Queen Elizabeth, and in one instance at least Shakespeare mentions it. This breed is also spoken of in the Sportsman's Cabinet, an old English work published in 1803, and in other old works, and from the descriptions there given it seems to have been in form and character the same as it is today. While, as remarked, the origin of the breed is lost in obscurity, it was unquestionably derived by selection and evolved from the ordinary foxhound, the latter having been bred down until the desired size was obtained. The true beagle is, as designated in the standard, a miniature foxhound. Of all the breeds of field dogs used in this country, the beagle, the most musical of the hound family, has unquestionably advanced the most in favor and standing with the sportsman. This is partly owing to the fact that comparatively few of our sportsmen had seen him at home on the trail of a rabbit, as we commonly call our hares, and as a result his good qualities and value as a field companion were unknown, and consequently could not be appreciated. His having advanced so fast of late in favor and appreciation is partly due to the natural order of events, in that as certain parts of the country become thickly settled and the feathered game exterminated, lovers of field sports who have heretofore devoted their time in the field to bird shooting over setters, pointers, and spaniels, finding the game so nearly exterminated as to destroy the pleasure of seeking it, discard their bird dogs in favor of the beagle for so prolific is the natural game of this hound, the rabbit and hare, that even in the immediate vicinity of the largest cities, one can usually find enough of it to furnish a joyous day's sport afield. The writer can cite several instances where, as stated above, the bird dogs have been discarded and a small pack of beagles taken in their place, for the reasons advanced. He also knows of a place nearly in the heart of the city of Brooklyn where some wild hares have found their way and located. He can name several spots within a half hour's walk of the above-mentioned place where hares are to be found and where, by not hunting them with the gun, but by merely listening to the music of the hounds, he has been able to employ many an hour's sport and to break in his young puppies as at Dewey Eve. He has sat, watched, and listened to them as with their musically clear and flute-like notes and with ears that sweep away the evening dew and voices matched like bells. They trailed the little cotton tails. It is but a few years since any nondescript mongrel that would run a rabbit was called a beagle, and when we speak of rabbit dogs, we have to admit that popularly considered that includes all the small mongrel dogs in existence whose owners imagine, or have been told, will trail a hare. While, as remarked above, the beagle is an old breed, it cannot be said that, except in a few instances, we have bred this hound in our country systematically until within the last few years. The lamented late General Richard Rowett a number of years ago developed a strain so well and favorably known both for their field and show qualities, that they came to be generally known as the Rowett Hound. 
the imported hounds sam dolly and warrior were to the rowett hounds what ponto mall and pilot were to the famous laverack setters the foundation of the strain mr n elmore a number of years ago also imported several good beagles including his famous ringwood now dead from which he bred many of our most prominent hounds these two strains together with some other blood to which mr pottinger dorsey has bred form the nucleus of the blood we have in our beagle it remained however for the american beagle club formerly the american english beagle club organized in eighteen eighty four to create an impetus among the admirers of the breed and bring the merits of the little hound before such of the sportsmen as were not aware of its value several of our most prominent beagle breeders met and formed the above-named club a committee was appointed to draft a standard bench shows were requested to provide suitable classes where previously only one or two and perhaps no classes at all had been assigned the breed special prizes were offered by the club to stimulate competition and show managers were requested to appoint as judges men who were especially interested in the breed rather than men who perhaps had never seen a beagle at work and consequently could not know from a practical standpoint what is required of one to make it an ideal working hound the result is that the different shows have adopted the standard of the said club invites its members to judge and where the entries at the principal shows had previously consisted of one or two mediocre specimens and perhaps as many nondescripts under the plea that they were rabbit dogs the quality of the classes is now on fully as high a plane as that of any of the other breeds of field dogs exhibited and our breeders are now breeding them as carefully and as true to type as any other breed of field dogs is bred the entries at the prominent shows now number in the thirties and forties where formerly all types and sizes were represented the classes now exhibit an evenness heretofore unseen the scene at the westminster kennel club new york show in eighteen eighty eight when the open dog class of beagles was being judged was such that it will not soon be forgotten by the writer nor many other fanciers of the beagle who witnessed it the class consisted of some fifteen or more hounds every one of them i believe worthy a mention and all of them hounds which a few years since would have been capable of winning first prizes or championship honors at any of our shows they exhibited such a marked similarity of type and size that i remarked to my friend mr s t hammond while looking them over that one might well suppose they were representatives of a single pack which had been selected by their owner to represent his type whereas the hounds present represented drafts from several different kennels the manner in which they appeared is as vivid in the mind of the writer as though the scene was occurring at the present instant so fascinating was it it was indeed a beautiful sight and one long to be remembered as handsome a pack of beagles as ever graced a show ring all of working size and all looking as though thoroughbred workers and fielders all showing as beautiful hound character as any pack of foxhounds could in fact they looked and carried themselves like a pack of miniature foxhounds such is the style of the beagle one meets nowadays at our shows and in kennels of admirers of the breed in contrast to the beagles of all sizes and types found a few years since in our shows and kennels several of our prominent sportsmen here in the east have packs of various sizes while a large number have one or more hounds to show how wonderfully the beagle has increased in popular favor with us during the last few years it is only necessary to say that the writer has during the past four years collected a list of some nine hundred names of individuals owning beagles here follows approximately two and a half pages of the names of breeders and kennels and owners 
who were prominent at the time of the writing of this book. The writer also prides himself in his own kennel, in which he usually has eight or ten or more beagles. It is scarcely possible to bestow too much praise on this little hound, which has advanced more in popularity during the last few years among sportsmen in this country than has any other breed of field dogs. This is the natural result of our sportsmen becoming familiar by degrees with the value of this hound for field purposes. As civilization encroaches upon the haunts of the fox and the deer, causing them to decrease in numbers, sportsmen, who have heretofore hunted them with large hounds, discover that as this game grows scarce, it is better hunted with the beagle. Colonel F. G. Skinner, than whom no more ardent sportsman or hound man is to be found among us, always advocates the beagle in preference to fox or other hounds for foxes and deer in sections where they are scarce or are hunted to the gun, and for foxes when hunted with the gun as in the northern and New England states, this is owing to the fact that not being so fast as the larger hounds, they give better opportunity for shots, and particularly where the game is scarce, they do not frighten it so as to drive it far away, to remain perhaps for days as the larger hounds do. Dr. Downey of Maryland and his friends always use their beagles in preference to larger hounds when they go on their annual deer hunt to West Virginia. Thus it will be seen that the beagle is not only growing in popularity as we become more intimately acquainted with his value, but it is also in the natural order of events for him to grow in favor with us as game becomes scarcer. Although the beagle is too slow for fox hunting in some parts of the country, as for instance in the south, it is also used with success for that sport and preferred by many to a larger hound in localities where the foxes are hunted to the gun, for reasons herein later explained. The writer was some time ago informed by an acquaintance residing in Virginia that in order to satisfy some friends of the ability of his beagles to kill a red fox, he took his pack of hounds under 15 inches in height with an old foxhound to start them on the trail and soon started a fox. Being stationed himself on a hill, he was able to watch the entire hunt, and after a run of several hours, the beagles caught and killed the fox, while the old foxhound was not in at the death. I cite this instance because many claim that the beagle would be entirely useless in a fox hunt. The beagle is also used for hunting the large white hare, Lepus virginianus, which abounds in some parts of this country. A friend of the writer residing in Rhode Island, who has one of the largest and best packs of beagles in the country, hunted these hares with his pack last winter, but says that while the sport is exciting, it is not so much so as hunting the ordinary cottontail, Lepus americanus. This is for the reason that the large hare circles much farther off than the latter, running often miles before returning and consequently taking the hounds a greater part of the time out of the hearing and sight of the hunters. Anyone residing in any of our large cities can, if he have a sufficient amount of the instincts of the backwoodsman to make him worthy of the name of a sportsman, find spots by prospecting, as it were, where he can, almost any day, take his beagles and give them a chance to do some trailing. If such persons will do as the writer does, and not shoot these hares or allow their hounds to kill them, but look upon them in the light of prize jewels, they can have many an hour's sport at dusk or after business hours with their beagles. The writer recently had marked down a small patch of woods within fifty minutes' walk of his home, which had a solitary hare in it nearly the entire season, and which has afforded many an hour's sport for him and his beagles. A few such hares, carefully protected, may afford sport for a whole season. While the customary way of hunting the hare with beagles is for the sportsman to stand at runways or likely places where the hare will come when brought round by the hounds and shoot it as it passes, 
Others, again, do not use the gun at all, but let the hounds run the hare down and kill it. The beagle is the superior of the basset in that it can get over a rough country much easier and is not so extremely slow as the latter, and, being a smaller dog, does not require the room or amount of food that the latter does. The same amount of room and cooking, the latter no small item as far as inconvenience, work, and expense are concerned, that will keep a couple of foxhounds, will easily keep five or six beagles. Where one has several hounds, the latter points are of no little importance. It will readily be seen that the beagle is undoubtedly the best general utility hound we have. While it is beyond the means of the average American sportsman to keep a large kennel of bird dogs and have them all broken as they should be, it is but comparatively little expense to keep a pack of beagles all broken for field use. In some portions of this country, particularly the South as well as in England, large packs of beagles are to be found owned and maintained by sportsmen for their private enjoyment. One of the greatest pleasures of the practical sportsman is in showing himself a practical breeder, for to possess the knowledge and ability to become such is no small honor. To do this, one must have at least several dogs of the breed he is interested in, in his kennel. And as remarked above, if he have such a kennel, he has use for all his stock in the field. The amount of pleasure derived from his kennel by the writer is in proportion to the number of dogs or hounds in it, and few sportsmen care to have in their kennel more dogs than they have use for. This, as I say, illustrates the advantage of one's being partial to hounds. Outside of his qualities as a field dog, the beagle is a desirable house companion. Not over large, short-coated, and affectionate, he is a most desirable and lovable companion. If educated to it, he is an excellent watchdog. In my kennel, I have always found them exceptionally quiet and peaceable. I have always allowed them to remain loose and sleep as they liked, half a dozen or more in one bed, and they were invariably quiet and friendly to one another, while my neighbors, setters, pointers, and other dogs are constantly noisy and frequently quarrelsome. It is claimed by some people who are not fully acquainted with their good qualities that hounds are lacking in affection and are given to fighting. As regards the beagle, I am pleased to state that such is not the case. They are fully as affectionate and companionable as my setters, spaniels, or pointers. As I now write, my chair is surrounded by several of these little hounds, comfortably stretched out in repose. Every few moments, one or another gets up, places its feet on my lap and gazes at me pleadingly as it mutely seeks a kind word or slyly pokes its nose against my elbow as a more efficacious way of attracting attention, as some of the singular-looking hieroglyphics on the manuscript will allow the printer to attest. At the same time, another one, jealous of the attention shown the former, is sure to come forward and endeavor to push the other one away in order to have all the attention shown itself, and thus throughout the evening they are constantly making their presence known. My melody lies nestled beside me, always insisting on her right to a place, while I am constantly compelled to help the other hounds, including trailer, riot, music, trinket, and others, down time and time again as they claim their right to my attention. As for fighting, while I have known setters to kill one another in a fight in their kennel, I have never known of a single instance where my beagles have fought among themselves. Although they run together all day and sleep together in their kennel at night, unchained. As to breeding, it is generally believed by beagle fanciers that the progeny usually have a tendency to grow larger than their dam. It is therefore considered advisable to breed to a dam smaller than the sire and smaller than the size it is desired to obtain in the progeny. Beagles, generally speaking, require but little training to make them good workers. They take to their work naturally, and if given plenty of patience on game while young, they will, with experience, become self-trained. If kept in the country where they may run loose and roam about by themselves as they grow up, they are liable to wander off from their kennel 
and to hunt on their own account. They soon become accustomed to the ways and tricks of the bunny and learn to follow and circumvent him. If you do not let your puppies run loose, but wish to train them yourself, you may take them out with one or two steady, well-trained old hounds, and the youngsters will soon learn to follow and imitate them. Go out, if possible, about daylight or dusk when the dew is falling. Then you are more apt to find the hares moving, and as a result warmer trails will then be found than at other times. I lead my puppies to a spot where I think I will be most likely to find the hares, and then quietly take as comfortable a seat as I can find, on a stump or fence rail or elsewhere, and leave the puppies to their own resources. Being thus assured that you have no intention of moving away, and not having their thoughts drawn from what is instinctively bred in them, namely the desire to hunt, they will devote their whole attention to the finding of game. When thus giving the puppies their first experience, allow the older hounds to catch and kill the hare, as an incentive to the youngers to hunt more ambitiously for the next one. After taking your puppies out thus with a good working old dog a few times, they will take readily to the work and will soon develop into efficient workers. It is believed by some breeders of beagles that they are more subject to worms than most breeds. My experience has been that they almost invariably have them. Last year I bred and raised what was probably, without exception, the smallest grown beagle in this country, it standing in height only about seven to eight inches and weighing about four pounds. This beagle was proportionally small before weaning. When some eight weeks old and before weaned, it passed several large bunches of worms, and nearly all the puppies I have ever raised have been afflicted with these pests. I have always considered santonine to be the most efficacious and at the same time the safest remedy for worms in puppies. My mode of administering it is to give a dose each morning a short time before feeding for five days. Dose for a puppy, say, ten weeks old, two grains. It may be given in about a teaspoonful of milk or in a little butter. The former is more convenient and the puppy usually is more sure of swallowing the santonine. After the last dose, I give a physic composed of about one teaspoonful of castor oil, the same amount of syrup, not extract, of buckthorn, with two or three drops of turpentine added. It must be borne in mind that any treatment for worms is useless unless the medicine be administered on an empty stomach. The plan being to have the worms feed on the drug, which is poisonous to them. Regarding preparing beagles for the bench, it should be remembered that as the standard calls for a coarse instead of fine coat in texture, the novice should not endeavor to get the coat, as is done with most other breeds, in as fine a condition as possible. One of the characteristic faults of beagles is their tendency to being too slack in loin. Therefore, if your hound is unduly slack in loin, do not have it too low in flesh. It would, in such a case, be better to have it over full in flesh. The former condition aggravates, in appearance, the fault mentioned, while the latter tends to cover it up. I predict that as the worth of the beagle becomes better and more widely known and appreciated, and as the natural order of events causes him to become the field dog best adapted to the circumstances that are sure to exist, particularly in the settled localities of the east and the north, he will grow greater in popular favor than any of the other breeds of field dogs. As the ruffled grouse or partridge, the woodcock, bob white, and the various other game birds become practically exterminated as they do in those parts of the country which become thickly settled, our sportsmen find themselves compelled to go hundreds and even thousands of miles to find the amount of good shooting they had previously been accustomed to enjoy. This requires a longer purse and a greater amount of leisure than the great majority of them possess and consequently they have to adapt themselves to the circumstances and either forego their sport or seek game which has not as great an antipathy to civilization, thick settlements, and man, 
as our game birds have. The eastern sportsman will therefore, in future, have recourse to our little short-legged long-eared friend and will enjoy his outing just as well as erstwhile he did when his setter or pointer led him through the fields. In selecting a beagle for field use, one should, of course, look to those points of the most practical value. Probably the first matter to be considered is the question of size. This, of course, the buyer must decide for himself, whether he be governed by experience, fancy, or the advice of others. Next to the question of size, he should bear in mind that quality more important than speed, endurance. In order to obviate too great speed in a beagle, the standard limits of size of them in height to 15 inches, as in hunting the natural game of the beagle, the hare, only a low rate of speed is desired, and when using the beagle for fox and deer hunting, the object partly is to avoid the greater speed of the foxhound or deerhound. The weak points in the beagle, which seem to be characteristic of the breed, but which should be overcome by judicious mating and breeding, are an inclination to snippiness and to being long cast in the loin. The ideal beagle cannot be better described than by quoting from the standard. A miniature foxhound, solid and big for his inches, with the wear and tear look of the dog that can last in the chase and follow his quarry to the death. It is needless to say that a short or at least a strong loin is of far more importance in a hound than in a bird dog from the nature of his calling as stated above. Fully as important a point is the one of selecting a hound having good legs and feet. This is very important point in a bird dog and much more so in a hound. A beagle should be selected having well arched toes and the same close together with good hard pads underneath. A foot after the model of a cat's foot is to be preferred to what is known as a hare foot, so called from its similarity to the foot of a hare. In noting a beagle's feet and legs, it is also very important to get a good short and upright pastern, as the same is much stronger and can stand much more wear and tear than a long or sloping one. Besides, the latter is usually indicative of a hare foot, or more properly speaking, a hare foot from its shape causes the pastern to slope and be comparatively long. In a setter or pointer, a sloping pastern is desired to avoid the great strain upon it in suddenly stopping on a point, and which strain on a straight pastern would cause the same to knuckle over. But in a hound, the short, straight pastern is greatly to be preferred as far stronger and more enduring. The hound, from the nature of his work, not needing to subject himself to such a strain as mentioned regarding the bird dog. Next in importance, I should consider a good coat, which is coarse and of good length. This is the most important factor as, from the nature of his work, the beagle is compelled to hunt almost entirely in the thickest of underbrush, which, unless he be well coated, will tear his skin and flesh in a cruel manner and though he possesses the grit and pluck which causes him to apparently not mind it while keeping to his work, the poor faithful servant suffers for days until he recovers, and in the meantime is in no condition to hunt if it is desired of him. To show how thoroughly and comb-like the briars and brush work through a beagle's coat in ordinary hunting, one needs but to notice any beagle with a fair amount of white on him when he starts out to hunt and no matter how dirty and soiled his coat may be, it requires but a short hunt to make his coat look as neat and clean as though he had a thorough washing. When hunting, I have often practically convinced my friends of the same, using as an illustration a certain hound. This dog, which has a good deal of white on him, keeps his coat always dirty. After hunting some little time, he will have the appearance of having just been washed. I recently received a letter from a gentleman, a stranger who had a short time previously become interested in beagles. He informed me that he had theories of his own in regard to breeding, whereby he thought he could breed a beagle for practical use and at the same time have it show more beauty points than the beagle bred to the standard of the American Beagle Club as given herein. He wanted a short, fine, silky coat, 
and asked for my views in the matter. Regarding the coat, I gave them practically as above stated. A short time afterward, I received another letter from him, from which I quote verbatim, for the benefit of any such as may be inclined as he was. Dear Sir, I thank you very much for your extended reply to my suggestion about breeding beagles a little finer. My notion was that they could be bred to look more stylish without detracting from their field qualities. But I have no more to say. A hunt I had yesterday demonstrated the absolute correctness of the present standard. I think I shall have to tell you of it. An old hunting friend of mine here in Maryland has a strain of beagles he is very proud of, and we had a pair of them, one rough-coated fellow, and a pair of year-old youngsters hardly broken. He says his are Scotch beagles, whatever that may be. They are very small, say six pounds each, and have fine short hair and their skin, little beauties to look at. In an open country, they do very well. Yesterday we were on one of my father's farms near the river, which is full of briar patches and briary thickets. The rabbits are plentiful, but the little Scotchmen were literally worthless. In an hour they were cut up and came to heel, absolutely refusing to work. The one with a dense coat and a brush on his tail, followed by the brace of puppies, had to do all the hunting the rest of the day. He dodged in and out of the briars without getting a mark, while the blood from the rat-tailed brace made them look as if their throats had been cut. Hereafter I stand by the American Beagle Club's standard. My friend's faith was shaken, and he wants a brush-tailed pedigree dog to try on his bishes as an experiment. He lives in a better cultivated end of the country, and had not tried his much in briars before. Since the briar farms are the natural refuge of the rabbits and afford the best sport, he sees that a tougher hound is more useful. The day's experience was so exactly a corroboration of your letter, I quite enjoy giving it to you. Very truly. End quote. Also, to avoid having your beagle cut up more than can be avoided, it is well to select one having a low and well-set ear, and, as called for by the standard, quote, closely framing and interned to the cheek, close quote. The best hung ears will spread out considerably when the hound is running, and a poorly hung and high-set one will be greatly exposed to all the briars and thorns within reach. Do not merely have in mind an ear of great length. The shape of the nose or muzzle is, of course, no positive indication of the scenting powers of its possessor. But it is well to always choose the hound having a wide muzzle and good and open, moist nostrils. The same usually be indicative of fine scenting powers. A more important factor in a hound for rabbit or hare hunting than any other. I cannot say that I agree with the standard in preferring a full and prominent eye as called for, for the same reason that a fine soft coat and exposed ear is not desired. Personally, I prefer an eye somewhat protected and not as exposed as the one called for, as my experience has taught me that too full and prominent an eye is easily injured. While personally, as far as beauty is concerned, I admire a black and tan coat as giving a beagle decidedly the appearance of being a miniature foxhound, I consider it desirable and prefer for work a hound having plenty of white on him, as this enables one to readily see him at a distance. Beagles, like other hounds, are not specially obedient as to coming in when called, particularly when there appear any prospects of soon getting started on a warm trail, and one can often locate his hounds if they possess a fair amount of white, when otherwise they could not be seen and one can then get them, if desired, when otherwise he could not. As I stated above, the question of size is one on which there is a diversity of opinion. I shall not argue the question here or give my views either for or against the large or small beagle. 
but will say for the benefit of the novice or inexperienced who may contemplate purchasing beagles that it is usually a safe method when lacking practical knowledge or experience to be governed by the choice of what the majority would prefer or select the great majority of our practical beagle men who use their beagles for field purposes such as the late general rowett potting or dorsey f c phoebus of the somerset kennels a h wakefield lewis smith dr c e nichols w f rutter w s clark george lake and others prefer what is comparatively speaking the large beagle by that is commonly meant a beagle close in height to the limit allowed by the american beagle club standard fifteen inches the writer himself prefers this last mentioned type of hound and contends that where a hound of a certain speed is desired it is preferable to obtain it in a comparatively large hound than in a smaller one as the former necessarily will be built more on the lines of endurance than those of speed while the latter will be built more on the lines of speed than endurance and while the desired speed is obtained in either the former will combine it with the greater endurance and staying powers a most important requisite in a hound thus if a twelve inch and fifteen inch hound are bred to hunt at about a certain pace the latter must be a hound of more substance and bottom than the former or it will be the speedier and as a result while it has the desired speed it also combines the power to hunt longer than the former standards and points of judging the beagle skull value five ears fifteen eyes ten muzzle jaws and lips five neck five shoulders and chest ten back and loins fifteen ribs five four legs and feet ten hips thighs and hind legs ten tail five coat five total one hundred points standard and scale of points adopted by the american beagle club and endorsed by all the leading shows head the skull should be moderately domed at the occiput with the cranium broad and full the ears set on low long and fine in texture the forward or front edge closely framing an inturned to the cheek rather broad and rounded at the tips with an almost entire absence of erectile power at their origin the eyes full and prominent rather wide apart soft and lustrous brown or hazel in color the orbital processes well developed the expression gentle subdued and pleading the muzzle of medium length squarely cut the stop well defined the jaws should be level lips either free from or with moderate flues nostrils large moist and open defects a flat skull narrow across the top of the head absence of dome ears short set on too high or when the dog is excited rising above the line of the skull at their points of origin due to an excess of erectile power ears pointed at tips thick or hoardy in substance or carried out from cheek showing a space between eyes of a light or yellow color muzzle long and snippy pig jaws or the reverse known as undershot lips showing deep pendulous flues disqualifications eyes close together small beady and terrier like neck and throat neck rising free and light from the shoulders strong in substance yet not loaded of medium length the throat clean and free from folds of skin. A slight wrinkle below the angle of the jaw, however, may be allowable. Defects. A thick, short, cloddy neck carried on a line with the top of the shoulder. Throat showing dewlap and folds of skin to a degree termed throatiness. Shoulders and chest. Shoulders somewhat declining, muscular but not loaded, conveying the idea of freedom of action 
with lightness, activity, and strength. Chest, moderately broad and full. Defects, upright shoulders and a disproportionately wide chest. Back, loin, and ribs. Back, short, muscular, and strong. Loin, broad and slightly arched, and the ribs well sprung, giving abundant lung room. Defects, a long or swayed back, a flat, narrow loin, or a flat, constricted rib. Four legs and feet. Four legs straight with plenty of bone. Feet close, firm, and either round or hair-like in form. Defects, out at elbows. Knees knuckled over, or forward, or bent backward. Feet open and spreading. Hips, thighs, hind legs, and feet. Hips strongly muscled, giving abundant propelling power. Stiffles strong and well let down. Hocks firm, symmetrical, and moderately bent. Feet close and firm. Defects, cow hocks and open feet. Tail. The tail should be carried gaily, well up, and with medium curve, rather short as compared with the size of the dog, and clothed with a decided brush. Defects, a long tail with a teapot curve. Disqualifications, a thinly haired radish tail with entire absence of brush. Coat, moderately coarse in texture and of good length. Disqualifications, a short, close, and nappy coat. Height, the meaning of the term beagle, a word of Celtic origin and in Old English, bigel, is small, little. The dog was so named from his diminutive size. Your committee, therefore, for the sake of consistency, and that the beagle shall be in fact what his name implies, strongly recommend that the height line shall be sharply drawn at 15 inches, and that all dogs exceeding that height shall be disqualified as overgrown and outside the pale of recognition. Color. All hound colors are admissible. Perhaps the most popular is black, white, and tan. Next in order is the lemon and white, the blue and lemon models, then follow the solid colors, such as black and tan, tan, lemon, fawn, etc. This arrangement is, of course, arbitrary, the question being one governed entirely by fancy. The colors first named form the most lively contrast and blend better in the pack the solid colors being somber and monotonous to the eye. It is not intended to give a point value to color in the scale for judging. As before said, all true hound colors are correct. The foregoing remarks on the subject are therefore simply suggestive. General appearance. A miniature foxhound, solid and big for his inches, with the wear and tear look of the dog that can last in the chase, and follow his quarry to the death. Note, dogs possessing such serious faults as are enumerated under the heading of disqualifications are under the grave suspicion of being of impure blood. Under the heading of defects, objectionable features are indicated. Such departures from the standard not, however, impugning the purity of the breeding. In this standard it will be observed that the head is scored 35 points, which is the same number allowed for the body. In the standards for the various breeds of bird dogs, it has been deemed proper by all the breeders to allow a much less number of points for the head than for the body, as certainly a good body is of much greater importance in assisting a dog to be a good or successful hunter than a correspondingly typical head is. In the hound, the difference of importance between the head and the body should be more marked, as not only from the nature of his work does a hound rely on his natural instinct to pursue and kill his game, and not require the mental faculties necessary in a bird dog, but it is of more importance that his running and staying powers should be superior, as his work admits no rest or let-up until the game is captured. 
I do not mean to convey the impression that I do not consider a typical head of importance, as in no breed more than a beagle does the head give character to the dog. And no one can admire hound character in a beagle more than I do. I further claim that in assigning the numerical value of points in the standard, symmetry should be considered and allotted a certain number of points. The same is illustrated in the fact that there were two hounds to be taken and scored, both scoring the same number of points, and one hound should happen to be very nicely and symmetrically built, and the other out of proportion, say, for instance, short on the forelegs and long in the loin. The former would be undoubtedly selected even if scoring a point or two less than the latter, as it would be evident as far as appearances went that the former would be able to stand more work. While the sentiments expressed in the foregoing article are those of the writer individually, I may add that they are the same as have appeared in former articles by myself, and which I have submitted to several of our most prominent practical authorities on the breed, and they tell me they are practically the views held by themselves. End of section 14. Recording by Tom Mack.